book of 2 Peter chapter number 1. The other day the Lord began to burden my heart about a thought from this chapter. We'll, we'll get to it tonight. But let's begin reading verse number 1. The Bible says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust let's pray father we bless you we thank you lord for your goodness and your mercy towards us lord we're thankful we can have confidence and believe all the bible it's the word of god it doesn't contain the word, it is the word. And God, we're thankful for that tonight. We're thankful for the truth contained therein, the hope contained therein, and the precious promises that we can learn thereby. And Father, we are certainly grateful to be able to assemble once again with the saints of God and worship you in spirit and in truth. And God, we thank you, Lord, for those that give up their Sunday evening service to work with the children on the other side of the building. I pray you'd bless their efforts. Uh, Lord, I certainly pray for those children, what they face in this old wicked world. We didn't even imagine in our day when we were their age. And so, God, I pray you'd undergird them, and God, you'd help them. And, Lord, as they're learning the, the scriptures over there tonight, may they hide them in their heart that they might not sin against thee. And may that, Lord, uh, transform them into your likeness. I pray for those working with the teens as well. The prayer pressure facing our teens today is... Uh, uh, Lord, uh, insurmountable. But God, I pray that you would help them and help them to make the right choices concerning the things of God. Uh, now, Father, we are uh, certainly thankful for the upcoming election. We're thankful we still live in a free country where we're, we're allowed to vote. And Lord, I, I'm thankful for that. And we do pray for uh, those that are running for office, Lord, that are going there for the right reasons, that are interested in lord what is right and lord interested in what is right for the people of their uh, constituency and god i pray that lord your will be done in uh, the upcoming election we know that god you're the one that sets kings in order uh, and god we certainly pray that uh, we'll see the wrongs righted uh, through the primary and the election season uh, father we certainly do uh, thank you for the good singing we thank you for the good testimony God, we're thankful we have hope in Christ tonight. Now, Father, bless the reading of the Word of God. Uh, use this unworthy vessel. Help us to set in heavenly places tonight. Speak to our hearts and help us to embrace uh, the very Word of God. And God, we'll thank you for what you do, for it's in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus. We ask these things. Amen. And amen. I want to draw your attention to a couple things that Peter uh, is inspired to uh, pin down. Uh, I want you to notice, first of all, that he uh, brings out the precious faith of like-mindedness. Uh, we find that in verse number 1, again, he says, Simon Peter, a servant uh, and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them uh, that have obtained like precious faith uh, with us uh, through, right through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, there cannot be put enough emphasis... Uh, on the importance uh, of having a like-minded faith. Uh, can I say if there's any one area the devil tries to attack the church today, uh, it's to divide. Uh, the old uh, uh, battle theme, divide and conquer, still works. Uh, and it works in churches. Uh, the reason we don't see uh, great revival in our day is we don't have unity in our day. Uh, but when our uh, mindset uh, is not I, but Christ that liveth in me, uh, 
when our mindset uh, is seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, uh, when we put away our feelings, when we put away our uh, 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 sense of importance, uh, and we come together under the umbrella of truth, and we put Christ first, uh, and we have a like-minded uh, 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 agreement concerning the truth and concerning doctrine, uh, friends, no telling what God will do in our midst. Uh, but if we all have personal agendas, friends, God won't bless. Uh, the Holy Ghost is grieved when there's no unity. Uh, how pleasant, how beautiful it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. And I've seen it. If you've been around church a long time, I've seen folks that think that they're more important than somebody else. Well, here it is. We're all zeros with the hole knocked out of it. And the only one that matters is Christ. Uh, and so we see mm, the precious faith of like-mindedness. But he also deals with precious promises that are unprecedented. In verse number 4, he says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Without the precious promises of God, we'd be lost. Amen. Our mindset would be that of the world. Uh, listen, it's easy for us to stand and find fault in the world and throw off on the world. Uh, can I say the world's doing what the world's always done, sinning. Right. And that's what you did until uh, the Lord took the blinders off your mind and off your eyes to let you know you was lost. Uh, and uh, when you trusted Christ, it was the precious promises of God uh, that not only brought salvation to you, uh, but it brought the divine nature to you, uh, where you now had a new uh, man to, uh, living inside of you, the Holy Spirit of God, uh, who leads you and guides you into all truth. Uh, and all of a sudden, uh, the former things, the lusts of this world, lose their significance uh, because we have the truth. What a blessing to have the truth. Uh, uh, so many folks take for granted their Bible. Hmm? Where would we be without it? It's the absolute and final authority of our lives. And I'm thankful for the Scriptures. But we also find some other things that Peter mentions in this chapter. He lets us know our personal responsibility as being a believer of Jesus Christ. Every believer has personal responsibility. Now, the preacher can't go home with you and make sure that you read your Bible and that you pray and that you walk right and talk right, live right, do right. He can't do that but the Holy Spirit goes with you. And every one of us have a personal responsibility to God. Now, look what he says in verse number 5. He said, and besides this, the precious promises that gave us the divine nature. He says, giving all diligence, he says, you ought to make this a habit and make it in the forefront of your mind. Give it all you got. What should we give all we got to? It says, add to your faith virtue. Virtue is mm, described as good moral quality or what we would call as biblical convictions. You ought to have some biblical convictions about you. There are certain things that I don't do because in reading the Bible, the Holy Spirit convicted my heart not to do them. You ought to have some biblical convictions. You don't need the pastor to stand up here and tell you how to walk and how to talk. You've got the, you've got the Lord living on the inside of you, and you've got his word, uh, and he ought to secure some things in your life. He said, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge. How much do you know about the Bible? And you ought to know more about it this year than you did last year. Listen, I have a real difficult time with ignorance. Now, I'm not talking about people that have a learning deficiency. I'm talking about people that are lazy and don't learn. With the information age that we live in and all the information that is uh, available to us through that little thing we carry around in our pocket that used to was made to make phone calls on, there's no excuse to be ignorant. But can I say that through that same thing that the world has all the access to what the world has, every app and every social media and every, all that, you know you can get Bible apps? You can get our Bible app from our church. You know it's got a Bible dictionary on it. And you can learn as much about the Bible as you want to learn. We're to add to our virtue knowledge. 
and to knowledge temperance uh oh that's how we're to conduct ourselves mm. I know I'm looking at a bunch of rednecks I mean y'all look good with your shirts and ties and all that on but I know it don't take much for, for you to go off I, I know because I'm one too all right um, but when you put the Bible in you it'll control your temperament mm. Mm. there are things that aggravate me to no end but I don't act out on them because the Lord's put something in me it says add to knowledge temperance and to temperance I don't like this word patience uh, now don't pray for patience because with patience comes much tribulation a lot of hardship a lot of heartaches a lot of valleys to, to develop patience in our life and I'm not a patient person don't pray for me to have patience I don't want patience I'm not don't get in front of me doing 55 miles an hour in the left lane with your turn signal on I don't like it okay just don't do that that's what the emergency lane's for for me to pass you when you're doing that all right no I just I am not a patient person I know that's a, a character trait of mine that's not good. I need to read the Bible. I need to, I need to add to my knowledge and temperance, patience. But that, that gene skipped our whole household. None of us have patience. You know, it's one of those deals, huh? But, uh, you know, that's, that's one of those things we've got to work on. You've got to be patient. You've got to let God do the work. A lot of times we want to help God out. But Bob, he said, be still and know that he's God. Sometimes we want to get in there and say, God, this is what you need to do, this is what you need. No, no, he knows what he's doing. And he does all things well. We just need to learn to wait upon the Lord. And when we do, it renews our strength. The, the temperance, patience, and the patience, godliness. That's a good thing. People ought to see you and say, you're a Christian, aren't you? By your speech, by your conduct, by your character, by your countenance, they ought to see Christ in us. He says, and to godliness, brotherly kindness. We ought to be kind to one another. Hey, I, I have a real problem with Christians that want to fight amongst Christians. You know, we're only going to heaven together. We're only going to spend all eternity together. You know, it takes uh, uh, seemingly uh, more to be unkind to people than it is to be kind to people. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to show brotherly kindness to one another. As a matter of fact, it's biblical. And then it says... And a brother, brotherly kindness, charity. Be compassionate. Be charitable to people. You don't have to look very far to find somebody going through a rough time. And sometimes it's not about you giving them money. Sometimes it's giving them an ear. Just showing you care. I told you all the story coming back from the rescue mission last week and uh, the fellow that got saved... Uh, all because one man saw him walking down the road and said, Hey, buddy, you got a bed to sleep in tonight? The man wasn't a drunk. He wasn't a, a dope addict. Uh, but they took the man who was, uh, in all essence, homeless, just hoboing through life. Young man, probably early 20s. Took him and gave him a bed. He got to listening to preach and hung around there for about a week and a half, got born again. Why? Because he was charitable. He could have drove right past him like everybody else did on that highway. But he showed him the love of Christ. And it says, charity. And listen to verse 8. For if these things be in you and abound. It didn't say if you know about these things. But if they're in you and they're part of your makeup, you start practicing them in your life. They make you that ye shall neither, neither be barren or unfruitful, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know why so many Christians are empty? They don't put those things into practice. Hmm? You know why so many Christians don't have fruit? Because they don't put the right seed in their life. But the Bible says that if we put these things in our lives and we allow these things to work out through our lives, we'll never be barren and we'll never be unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see that there is a personal responsibility we all have to practice the Bible, to heed to the Bible, to put this into motion in our lives. But then I see a problem when one's deficient in these areas. Look at verse number 9. But he that lacketh these things, uh-oh, listen what it says, is blind 
and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. You know why so many people struggle with whether or not they're really saved? They haven't put that into practice. They're blind, and they've forgotten, Miss Cinda, that they were purged from their old sins. So they spend their life a struggle. Am I saved? Am I not saved? Am I saved? Am I not saved? Am I saved? Am I not saved? And the devil's got you right where he wants you. You've not put the Bible into practice in your life, and now you don't even know if you're a child of God. Now, how in the world can you be effective in anybody else's life? Hmm? But notice he says, he that lacketh these things is blind. I got some notes that I've written down over the years about blindness. Blindness is caused by your DNA. The reason folks are blind and lost in sin is they were born sinners. Hmm? Uh, blindness is caused by disease. You get a bacteria in your eye, you can go blind. You get sin in your life, you can go blind. Mm? Uh, blindness is caused by uh, uh, being defiled, having an injury, and taking some poison. And can I say again, sin can poison you. Blindness is caused by diabetes. Mm? If you get so, too much of that sweet sugar preaching, you'll go blind. I love preaching on heaven, but I live in the nasty now and now. And sometimes I need to hear about how wicked I really am. Hmm? Uh, blindness also caused by deliberate willfulness. Hmm? I wrote this down. Blind people feel their way through life. You ever notice there's a crowd they only want to worship if they feel good? Might be blind. Hmm? Uh, I wrote this down. Blind people fall a lot. They fear a lot. They follow someone a lot. They're fooled a lot. And according to verse number 9, they forget a lot. Hmm? I don't want to be blind. Hmm? But then we see Peter in verse number 10. He prompts us to be diligent. He mentioned it earlier, but in verse number 10 he says, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to making your calling and election Sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. I'm standing here before you, a man who's been saved 48 years. In 48 years, I've seen a whole lot of people fall from the grace of God. They didn't lose their salvation, but they got out of the will of God. They made a mess of their lives. My mind right now is thinking of preachers that used to stand behind pulpits, but tonight they're not qualified. My mind right now is thinking about people who used to teach the Bible, but they're not in church. My mind is thinking about people who used to serve in the church, and they're not serving in the church anymore. Why? They didn't put these things to practice. They didn't give diligence to what it takes to keep us from falling. And can I say throughout the scriptures we find many people have fallen. David fell because he was idle. He was supposed to be out fighting the battle of the kings. He said, I'm sitting this one out. He sat around the house, and that's when he saw Bathsheba. Mm -hmm. Can I say Samson fell because he became complacent? Mm -hmm. He thought his strength would carry him through all the way. Mm -hmm. Can I say Saul fell because he got full of pride? When he was little in his own eyes, God used him. But when he got full of Saul, he fell. Moses fell, he smote the rock because he got discouraged. If you look around, instead of looking up, you can get discouraged and you can fall. Titus fell because of disbelief. He just doubted everything that was said. And then we even find the writer of this epistle, Peter, fell because he thought he couldn't fall. The Bible says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. With God's help, I want to preach on this little thought tonight. I won't preach long, but I want to preach on how to know you're headed for a fall. How to know you're headed for a fall. I say that because I've seen too many fall. This thing's winding up. I don't know how much more time we have before Jesus comes, but I know the world is pointing to the direction he's coming. Uh, we may have uh, uh, just a couple weeks, we may have a couple years, we may have a couple decades. That's all God's business, but I do know this, uh, 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 very soon I believe we're headed home. Until then, 
We ought to do everything within our power to be what God expects us to be. I don't want to limp into heaven. I want to go out in a blaze of glory, don't you? I want to go out with my head held high, saying like Paul did, I fought a good fight, I kept the faith, I finished my course. I don't want to go back in, in like Peter when he was on the, uh, the seashore and Jesus is, and got him some bread and fish and said, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? I don't want the Lord to have to remind me how good and gracious he is. I want to go in knowing the goodness and grace of the Lord. So how do you, to know you're headed for a fall? And I say, first of all, you know you're headed for a fall because you'll start drifting. Drifting. Now, Miss Nett loves the beach. She loves the beach so much, I just booked a trip for us to go to the beach. That's how much I know, how I knew what the price of airfare is and the price of rental cars, huh? Uh, but there's one thing about, a, about the beach. Mm, the ocean comes in and the ocean goes out. The ocean comes in, the ocean goes out. Certain times of the day, it goes out a little farther, then it comes in. It goes out a little farther, and it comes in. And if you put a float out there on the ocean, it'll come back up to the seashore, and then it'll go back out. And then it'll come up, and then it'll go out. And then it starts going out a little farther, a little farther, a little farther. Before long, you can't see the float anymore. And that's what happens with Christians. They start coming to church, and they start going out to the world. They start coming to church and start going out to the world. They come to church and they go out to the world. And the problem, Brother Tyler, is they'll come to church, but they don't do anything with what they hear. And they go back out in the world. They come to church uh, and they don't uh, uh, add to their faith, diligence, and all these things, virtue and knowledge and temperance and patience, uh, and they go back out in the world. Uh, it seems like, uh, Brother Ray, every time they go out in the world, the world gets a little bit more of them. Uh, and they come back to church uh, and they go out. And all of a sudden, church becomes an obligation uh, instead of a desire. Church becomes uh, a habit instead of worship. Uh, and before long, uh, uh, they're out in the world so far you don't even see them anymore. There's a lot of good, God, good, good people, God's people, that are out there somewhere. And they don't come back to church because now they're embarrassed like Peter was on the seashore. And that's why when we come in contact with them, or we ought to go after them and let them know Jesus still loves them and so do we. But you're headed for a fall when you start drifting, when church is just something you do. When you come to church if it's convenient, and it's okay to miss a service here and there in your mind, and all of a sudden, you know, well, you know what? Uh, nobody's going to miss me if I don't go tonight. Nobody's going to miss And And I, you know what? We had a host of people that was here this morning. They're not back tonight because they're drifting. They didn't have anything better to do. They just decided that it wasn't as important to them, and they're drifting. They don't get that thing back to the shore. They're going to fall. Hmm? Preacher friend of mine from Chipley, Florida, I said this years ago, Paul Hill, I've never forgotten it. He said, long before they cross the threshold to leave, their heart's already gone. When you start drifting, it's because your heart's no longer in it. When your heart's no longer in it, that ought to be a red flag. Because hmm? true worship, as we heard last week from Brother Jimmy, comes from the heart. You know you're headed for a fall when you begin drifting. Can I say this? You know you're headed for a fall when you become disgruntled. Yeah, unhappy with the things going around church. You get disgruntled. You know, why does the preacher preach so long? Or why does the preacher preach on that? There's so much other things. Why don't he preach on love more? Why don't he preach on heaven more? Why don't he preach on Miss Crystal more? And why don't I, you know, you just get disgruntled. You're always finding fault. Mm -hmm. Well, I saw Miss Mary go and shake uh, Miss Sydney's hand, but she didn't come shake my hand. That Mary, she's stuck up. But well, that is a true statement, by the way. She is stuck up. No, she's not. No, she's not. Well, a little bit, but not bad. She's not bad. She's just kind of Baptist stuck up. She's not bad. She's okay. All right? Uh, but see, we get this, uh, we, we just start getting unhappy we're unhappy with who sings. We're unhappy with who's teaching. We're unhappy with who's preaching. We're unhappy with, you know, where Miss Tammy planted the flowers. Why didn't she plant them over here instead of planting them over there? We're unhappy with uh, the way Brother Brian parts his hair. He doesn't have a choice. 
Well, we're just disgruntled. We start finding fault, finding fault in everybody. We do it. Look at the dress she's wearing. Look at look at his socks don't match. And we just we just are disgruntled. And instead of looking inwardly and saying, "Lord, what is wrong with me?" We start looking to find fault somewhere else. When you get that kind of attitude, you're headed for a fall. Hmm? I thought about this. You know, you're headed for a fall when you become derelict in your duties. Hmm. See, there are certain things that you have told God you're going to do, whether something seen in the church like teaching or cleaning or mowing or that, or maybe you've promised God you're going to get up early every day and pray, and maybe you've promised God you're going to read a chapter a day or whatever, and all of a sudden you quit doing those things. Hmm. You know, used to in the military, if you were found in dereliction of duty, you were court-martialed. Now they just let you quit. We've gotten so soft in America. Uh, when you become dereliction of duty at the church, it not only affects the body of Christ, it not only affects what goes on around the church, but it affects heaven. Because now somebody's got to pick up your slack. You become derelict in your duties you're headed for a fall listen if you're more faithful to your job than you are the Lord you might want to do some checking up because I've got news for you the Lord's one gave you your job the Lord's one gives you the strength to perform your job you ought to, you ought to give your boss man everything when you're there you ought to work hard you ought to earn your paycheck. Uh, you ought to uh, be the best employee that he's got. But you still ought to put the Lord first. If you give the Lord less than you give your boss man, you're derelict of duty. You really are. I thought about this. I just can't get off that. There's just some folks, Brother Donald, they're just not pulling their load. Now, if you all of a sudden decide you're going to quit, that means... Me and somebody else got to pull your load plus our load. That hurts the body of Christ. You've heard the old old adage, a change only as strong as its weakest link. The reason churches aren't thriving is we're having to pick up too many links that are missing. Uh, you know, I, I've got a lot, of, a lot of hens that are mothers around here. Miss Lynn. Miss Mary. No, it's a good thing. I already got on you for the bad thing. Uh, and there's some others. My brother Doug, take it easy. You know, you know when, when I've had health problems or whatever, brother Doug, just take it easy. You don't have to go. But see, I'm only wired one way. If it's for Christ, you give it all you got. Hmm? Say, brother Doug, you're liable to have a heart attack and die. Well, don't threaten me with heaven, okay? I'm, 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 it'll be all right. Now, I know what you, you're saying. You, you don't want anything bad to happen to the preacher, and you want everything to go well, and, and you're concerned about me, and I appreciate that, but you've got to understand how I'm wired. Uh, listen, uh, uh, too many of my years I spent my life uh, uh, chasing a ball or doing something that doesn't uh, really matter in this world. Uh, and if I do that for something as silly as a ball game, why would I give my Lord anything less than that? Uh, and I can't jump as high as I used to and can't run as fast as I used to and can't do all that I used to, but I still try to give it all I got when I'm preaching because I love Jesus that much. But when we get derelict and we don't give it our all, we're headed for a fall. Thought about this. When we become divisive, we're headed for a fall. What do you mean by that? When we're offended by everything. It's one thing to be disgruntled. It's another thing to be divisive. Because when you're offended, you make certain you let everybody else know because you want them to be divisive too. That's how church splits start. Somebody gets offended, and it's usually because the preacher preached on their sin. And then they try to turn other people against the preacher because they're offended. Listen, I've been around preaching all my... And by the way, his granddaddy was a rough preacher. He didn't sugarcoat anything. 
And every now and then he might even cuss in the pulpit a little bit. I'm not kidding you. I mean, he just laid her out there. He really didn't give a rip who cared, huh? That's just the way he was. I've been around preaching all my life. I'm talking about all 58 plus years I've been around preaching. I've never had a preacher preach this book to me and it offend me. Now, I've, he I've heard some preachers go outside this book that offended me. I was telling my Sunday school class uh, uh, this morning, I heard a preacher one time say, if your wife doesn't do what you say, punch her in the face. That's not Bible. Jesus said, husbands love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. You're not to punch your wife, you're to love your wife. That offended me because that preacher took a precious time where he could be telling somebody the truth and he told them a lie. That offends me. But I've never had a preacher preach this book that offended me. Now, I've had some uh, skin me alive from this book. You know what happens? Uh, I try to get in the altar, get right with God, then I hug their neck and thank them for preaching the book to me. But if the preaching of the Word of God offends you, the problem in the preacher, the problem is your heart. Mm -hmm. And when we become divisive because we didn't like what was preached, or we didn't like what was going on, I've heard people say, well, how come they get to do everything? Because I can count on them to do it. Hmm? It's real simple. You know how many people in the last 22 plus years have volunteered to do something around here and about two weeks later me and my wife was having to do it because they quit already? So there's a reason there are certain people do certain things because I don't have to go to bed at night worried about whether or not they're going to get done because they've proven themselves to be faithful. Hmm? You want to get involved in something? Get faithful. Hmm? If you're accountable, we'll put you to work. And I say this, you're headed for a fall. I know this isn't shouting like this morning, but this is what we need. Yeah. And I've seen too many fall. You know what? We filled the sanctuary up three times for the people who have left this church in the last 22 years. I'm not talking about being led to another church. I'm talking about people out of church. You know you're headed for a fall when you begin delighting in things that used to bore you. Things that used to disgust you, and now you delight in it, you're headed for a fall. I, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to be me right here. It's getting to the point I can't hardly watch TV anymore. I can't watch the commercials. I can't watch any nightly drama on TV anymore because they are embracing things that are against the Bible and that are a slap in the face to me as being a Christian. Hmm? There are some things that we have started streaming, like Pure Flix, that doesn't have that junk. Because I just can't stand it anymore. I'm tired of seeing it. It disgusts me. I'd rather not turn the stupid thing on than be disgusted. But when those things that disgust us all of a sudden become okay, you're headed to a fall. <coughs> just headed to a fall I'm tired of it I told y'all I told, told Steve in my office I quit watching the news I got tired of being lied to pick the channel CNN, MSNBC, Fox pick them all they all have the same talking points so whoever is funding those places are telling them what to say and you can bank on the fact that if they're reporting on it it is a, it's a distraction of what really is going on. Because they're lying to you. Hmm? They don't tell us the truth about anything. And he said at my office, he's right. Anything with three letters, FBI, CIA, I'll throw in CNN. They don't care about what's right. They don't care what's right for the American people. They've sold out, and they have personal agendas, and it's all about power. It's not about what's right. I thought the FBI was supposed to uphold the law. How come Hillary's not in jail? <clears throat> I've seen enough proof to indict her. Where's the grand jury? They've been bought off too. You're welcome. It didn't cost you anything. I would just tell the truth. Huh? Matter of fact, if the FBI did their job, most of Washington would be behind bars. You ever hear of insider trading? 
Poor Martha Stewart went to jail for it. How come Nancy's not in jail? You know how many millions of dollars she's made in the last decade alone from insider trading? Huh? And how can on a $147,000 a year they can keep buying these 5 and $10 million mansions all over the place? You're welcome. That didn't cost you anything either. You know what solve all that? Term limits. Hmm? Prison. I like that. Whoever said that. Uh -uh. Let's see. <clears throat> they go to Washington and they fill their pockets from big oil companies and big businesses and from George Soros who says, here's all you could ever want. It's kind of like when the devil took Jesus up on the pinnacle and said, you can have all this. Just bow down and worship me. And the problem is, is Washington's bowed down. And Jesus didn't. You know what Jesus said? It is written. Mm. When you begin delighting in those things that used to bore you, used to disgust you, you're headed for a fall. I thought about this lastly. You know you're headed to, for a fall when you start walking closer and closer and closer to the ditch. As long as you stay in the middle of the road called straight, you'll never fall. You know how you get there? Putting into practice this chapter. Well, you start walking closer and closer to the ditch, and I see it. Folks try to figure out how close they can live to sin and still be a Christian. Well, you can't be close to sin and truly be a Christian. You know what Christian means? Christ-like. Right. Mm -hmm. The closer and closer you get to the ditch, the more likely you are to fall. There's a lot of people end up in the ditch. Now, I have good news. 1 John 1, 9 tells us if we'll confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you step in a mud puddle or even if you fall in a ditch, there is provision made where God will forgive you. But can I say, most of the time when people fall, something gets broken. And can I say, they can get forgiveness, but they may have to walk with a lamp. Or they may have a scar the rest of their life that they didn't have to have if they'd adjust put into practice the Word of God in their life. Listen, I'm for you. I'm not against you. I don't want to see anybody fall. I want to see you shine as lights in this dark world. I can't believe how dark it's gotten the last year and a half. I mean, I cannot fathom in my mind that things are really happening in America that are happening in America. You know the only true remedy is folks to stand and be a lighthouse, be salt, to shine the light of Jesus, and to walk in the steps of Jesus, and to show them what real Christianity is all about. See, the world's seen fake Christianity. The world's tried fake Christianity. It doesn't satisfy, and it doesn't change them. But real Christianity changed their life. And I'm certainly glad that I'm saved by the good grace of God. Am I perfect? Heck, no, I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect. But I can tell you one thing. I have a desire to be. I have a desire to live Christ-like. Because there's too many lives at stake. And here's the real danger, Brother Mike. We really don't know how many people's watching us. And if we fall, how many people are we going to take with us? There are some people just wanting to know, is it real? And they're watching your life. Amen. And they'll come to a conclusion one day, it's real. Told this story. I don't know if I told it preaching or told it in Sunday school. Gosh, it's hard to believe. Back 25, 26 years ago, I actually worked in corporate America. And I worked for a Jewish company. And uh, found out a lot about the Jewish mindset. And uh, 
enjoyed learning a lot about it. You enjoyed picking on a lot of the Jews that I worked with, and we had a good time. Uh, but there was uh, one of the owners of the company. I was in his office one day, went to share something with him, had to do something on the business side, and he had the most beautiful calendar hanging on his wall. And it was a rendition of what Solomon's temple would have looked like. And it was breathtaking. And Brother Bob, I just looked at him, I said, Boy, that's, that's beautiful. It's Solomon's temple. He says, you know about that? And so, I let him know I knew a little bit about Solomon's temple. A couple of days later, I'm in my office, and he comes in, and he sits down. He says, tell me everything you know. I'm thinking, okay. Uh, about the Reds, uh, about the meaning of life, uh, about how to make Skyline chili. I mean, what do you want me to tell you that I know? Which I don't know much about any of those things, but he says, tell me everything that you believe about the Bible. And I had the privilege for four hours teaching Old Testament survey to a Jewish man. I took him back from the beginning. With Adam and Eve, took him to Abraham, took him to Moses, took him to the law and the prophets, brought him right up to Calvary, Jesus Christ, and told him what we believe. You see, the Jews are very guarded because they have been attacked and they've been discriminated against throughout history. There's been a lot of people that say, I'm for you, only to turn around and be against them. And so when I explained to him the mother-daughter relationship between Judaism and the church and how Christ grafted in the church a branch into the true vine, and I, I showed him all of that, and this is what he said, Brother Ron. Four hours, I got to preach Christ. He said, I can tell you one thing. You know what you believe. Now, what greater thing can be said of us? He said, you know what you believe. He didn't bow and ask Christ to save him. He got up and walked out of the office. Every time I come in contact with him after that, his countenance was different. Three days later, that calendar, it was so beautiful, was sitting on my desk. I don't know if he ever got saved. Don't know if he ever thought about it much anymore. I did see him one day. Miss Annette and I was going into Joe's Crab Shack down there on, on the river, and he and his father was coming out, and he lit up like a Christmas tree to see him. And this was 20 years later. And uh, talked to him for a minute. I hope that what I had to say took lodge in his heart, and he's turned to Christ. But what I'm trying to say to you is know what you believe. Practice what you believe. Because there are people taking note of it. They want to know if it's real. He was glad to hear that I was for Israel. That I pray for Israel. My dear friends, they want to know if what you say you really believe. Put it into practice. If not, you're headed for a fall. Last thing that any of us ought to ever desire to be is a, is a statistic. Well, I've known a lot of once wasers. I once taught Sunday school. I once was a preacher. I, want, I don't want to be a once waser or used to be or has been. I want to be in the fire. I want to be faithful. How about you tonight? God spoke to your heart. There's something in your life that maybe you've allowed to creep I mean we've come out of revival meeting is, is the revival fire still burning or have you allowed something to creep in that's caused you to maybe drift a little bit or get a little disgruntled or get your eyes off of Jesus and I'd be a good night to take care of that thing and put your feet back in the center of the lane on the highway that you can make an impact for Christ in these days let's all stand Brother Ray come get a song of invitation while they come let's have a word of prayer Father we bless you Thank you for the scriptures. Lord, they're a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. Lord, help us to put them into practice. Lord, we know that there are people watching. The Bible says we're written epistles known and read of all men. 
Help us, Father, to always shine Christ from our lives. Lord, I pray for this invitation. Maybe somebody's headed toward too close to the ditch. I pray that tonight, Lord, you would recapture them. Lord, you'd return unto them the joy of their salvation. God, there may be some here tonight that aren't saved. Lord, I pray tonight would be the night of their salvation. Maybe some that are saved, but they've been in a far country. I pray they'd come home tonight. I pray that, Lord, your will be done this invitation. Maybe somebody's been a real blessing to somebody, Lord, and somebody just wants to go by their way and let them know that you've been a blessing. Thank you. You've helped me. Lord, just move in this invitation. Speak to hearts. We'll give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.